The proceeding will start shortly. 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 Order, order. Morning, ladies and gentlemen. May I, uh, just before we start, remind members to observe social distancing and wear masks when possible. Luke Pollard to move the motion. Thank you very much, uh, Sir Roger. It's good to see you uh, in the chair. Um, I beg to move that this House <laughs> has considered approval for the use of neonicotinoids and the impact on bees. Um, First, can I declare an interest that my family keep bees on our farm in North Cornwall. I'm also patron of Pollenize, which is a brilliant beekeeping CIC in Plymouth. And I can tell you that all the honey they produce is delicious. Um, I bloody love bees. Um, <laughs> bees might be small creatures, but their contribution to nature and to the production of food is huge. Up to three quarters of crop species are pollinated by bees and other pollinators. Bees are a symbol of a healthy environment. Bees, whether honeybees or bumblebees, are iconic British species too. They're a weather vane species, against which we can chart nature's recovery or decline. And for me, bee health is non-negotiable. We are in the middle of a climate and ecological uh, crisis. That means we must not only act faster to cut carbon and do so fairly, creating green jobs, but we also must protect nature. And that means taking difficult decisions to protect our natural world. We will never be nature positive if we dodge the difficult decisions or turned a blind eye to our role in the erosion of nature. Happy to. And congratulate him on securing this important debate. Would he agree with me that the legal requirements in the Environment Act to hold species loss by 2030 won't be worth the paper they're written on if at the first hurdle the government actually fails and gives a license to something that their own scientific advisers are advising against? Thank the Honourable Lady for summing up my entire speech in one pithy intervention. Uh, but she, 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 is, uh, she is absolutely correct by that. And I will seek to explain that using more words over the next ten minutes or so. Um, bees are not only more in danger every year, bees are more important every year. According to the UN, the volume of agricultural production dependent on pollinators has globally increased by 300% in the last 50 years. The UN also found that greater pollinator density results in better crop yields, so it's also good for farmers as well. And that's why this is such an important uh, and urgent debate. Because bee health in this country is not getting better, it's getting worse. Banning bee-killing pesticides will not reverse the decline in bee populations alone. But if we cannot deal with this most apparent of ills, how will we deal with the hundreds of more difficult decisions that must follow in relation to protecting habitats and providing a guide to bee recovery? Happy giving way. May I also congratulate him um, for securing this important and very well attended debate. Will he join with me in um, thanking and congratulating the local authorities across this country, including Kent County Council, who have put together uh, plans such as Kent's Plan B uh, <laughs> to protect and enhance our, our bee populations and to do what they can to protect uh, the natural environment across their counties. Well, I thank the Honourable uh, Lady for her intervention and I agree with what she says. I think local government has a really significant role in nature restoration and bee recovery in particular because ministers might be able to set the strategic framework but it will be local government that will be delivering that on the ground in all our communities and I commend Kent for the work that they are doing. Uh, I'm also grateful for Bug Life, RSPB and the Wildlife Trust nationally and Devon Wildlife Trust locally for help in preparing for this debate. The House of Commons Library has also been superb with a great briefing note. And I'm grateful for members in all parties 
for stopping me so frequently over the past week or so to talk about bees and for asking me to mention that their particular uh, concerns in this debate, and I hope that my speech will convey the strength of their feeling on a cross-party basis. In this debate, I want to do three things. Firstly, I want to make the case for a ban on bee-killing pesticides to be restored. No ifs, no buts. Secondly, I want to challenge the minister and the industry to do more to help sugar beet farmers, some of whom are facing financial losses and real difficulties because of aphids. Thirdly, I want to argue that in the middle of a climate and nature emergency, future authorisations of bee-killing pesticides must be subject to a parliamentary vote rather than quietly snuck out by ministers. Bee species and populations are in decline. Research suggests that a third of the UK bee population is thought to have vanished in the last 10 years, and since 1900, the UK has lost 13 out of 35 native bee species. These are really frightening figures, and they are continuing. But instead of taking action to protect our bees in a meaningful way, I'm concerned that the government has chosen instead to, to uh, temporarily lift the ban on Cruiser SB, which is a neonicotinoid pesticide that is banned under UK law, except for certain exceptions that can be authorised in the event of an emergency. This is not just a step in the wrong direction for our bees. It is a dramatic fall and an erosion of our overall steps towards being a net zero nature positive country. One teaspoon of neonicotinoid is enough to kill 1.25 billion honeybees, equivalent to four lorry loads, according to uh, Professor Dave Goulson, uh, Professor of Biology at the University of Sussex. We do need more research on the true effects of neonicotinoids on bee populations, not just on every species, but on the different types of bee within a population. In particular, beekeepers are reporting that in areas where neonicotinoids have been used in the past, the behaviour of queens is different to the behaviour of worker bees, for instance, and more research is needed. But this isn't the first time we've discussed bees. Indeed, I have many times with the minister who's in her place. Uh, indeed, she said in the House of Commons on the 16th of December last year that there's a growing weight of scientific evidence that neonicotinoids are harmful to bees and other pollinators. And I agree. And DEFRA's chief scientific advisor said that neonic use must be kept to an absolute minimum to address, to address bee decline. And I agree. But the government has not stuck to those words in the actions that they take. When we left the EU, the government promised to follow the science on bee-killing pesticides. It said its decisions about emergency authorisations would be guided by two expert bodies, the Health and Safety Executive and the Expert Committee on Pesticides. The Minister told the Commons on the 6th of uh, September last year, and I quote, decisions on pesticide authorisations are based on expert assessment by the Health and Safety Executive. Lord Goldsmith and the other place made the same commitment, word for word, when addressing the Lords on the 27th of September last year. But those words haven't rung true in the actions. Both of these expert bodies recommended that emergency authorisations for neonic bee-killing pesticides should not be given for sugar beets in January last year. The expert committee on pesticides said, and again I quote, the conditions for allowing an emergency derogation have not been met. It is said that the risk to bees and freshwater biodiversity outweighed the benefit to sugar beets. And that's important. The health and safety executive came to a similar conclusion. So DEFRA has lifted a ban on neonics against the overwhelming advice of its own expert bodies, which it said it would be guided by. That suggests that this decision was a political one, not a scientific one. I know some people will look at donations from big sugar to the government party, but I don't subscribe to that argument. I think it is more simple than that. I think when given the option to take bee health more seriously, the government chose not to. I don't think it is a bigger conspiracy than that. I think they simply chose not to act in the way they could do to support bee health. And that sets a dangerous precedent, because although neonics are largely banned in this country, that doesn't mean anything when the government is willing to authorise emergency use in circumstances that, frankly, aren't emergencies. So let me turn to my asks. Firstly, we know that 12 other European countries have decided to authorise neonics this year. But for such a hard Brexit government, it is slightly odd that they now hide behind what Europe does. Indeed, the PM promised to deliver a green Brexit, and the former Environment Secretary said in 2018 that Britain would demonstrate global leadership on environmental policy after Brexit. So why aren't we leading when it comes to saving the bees? and other essential pollinators. A commitment to support biodiversity must be delivered through action, not words or press releases. I want the ban on bee-killing pesticides restored and locked in. To do that, we need to look carefully at what alternatives are available to support sugar beet farmers.
for giving way. I thank my uh, honourable friend for giving way, and he must be positively buzzing for securities <laughs> debate today. Um, um, I speak as a Manc <laughs> Union. Uh, the B, of course, is a historic symbol of Manchester. I now live in Frotsham, where I represent, and that is also the symbol of Frotsham. Uh, it's named after Reverend William Charles Cotton, who was, uh, who was a beekeeper. Uh, I agree very much on that point, made by my honourable friend, that uh, actually the government needs to take control now and put deeds, not just fine words, but deeds and actions into play to save our bees and nature. Uh, but I've managed to avoid in my remarks here. But he is right when he talks about the importance that local people have in bee populations. It's not just beekeepers. Bees are an iconic species. They're built into the fabric of our identity. And it's because of that that the, uh, what happens to bees is important not just to scientists, not just to beekeepers or honey lovers. It's important to our entire country. Happy giving way. Uh, the Honourable Member for Giving Way is making a, a great speech uh, setting out the issue. Um, will he agree with me that, that our constituents are uh, really concerned about this issue and don't understand the reasoning? As far as they're concerned, bees need to be protected and that must include this issue. And can I also put a plug in for another Reverend, the Reverend Tom Jameson in my constituency, uh, who works with an organisation called Young Dads and Lads, who are beekeeping as a way of... Um, building links and bonds. Order. Uh, one moment. I'm conscious of the fact that there are a number of members present who are not on the speaker's list who have put in to speak, who are taking the advantage of um, interventions to make speeches. Interventions are interventions. Luke Pollard. Thank you, Sir Roger. And I agree with my more friend uh, in terms of just how important bees are, but I also agree with a, 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 a part of her intervention when she says people don't understand why this has taken place. It is one of the reasons why sneaking out an authorisation on an issue as important to the public does the government no favours in this respect, because it suggests that the government doesn't have the strength in its own argument as to why an emergency authorisation is valid. And if it doesn't have the opportunity to put forward that case... I'm afraid the public will be left with only one, uh, uh, one conclusion, and that is that they simply uh, aren't in favour of the bee, uh, bee health that I think the majority of the British public are. Um, so, Roger, I want to turn now to sugar beet farmers in particular, nearly all of whom are located in the east of England. I want to make sure they're properly supported, because I don't doubt that they've had a difficult time in recent years in respect to, uh, to a number of uh, 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 issues affecting their crop. Sugar is a big business, and it's a high-value crop. British Sugar, one of the big sugar firms that dominate the market, recorded a £100 million profit in 2020. It is big business. But I don't believe that this granulated money-making machine, there's not a fa fairer deal for sugar beet farmers to help and support them against crop failures. Indeed, the latest sugar contracts put in place in the last 12 months do offer considerably more support to sugar beet farmers. And I'll return to that later. I know the Minister is keen to explore gene editing to make sugar beet more resistant, and although I'm not a fan of the lack of proper regulation and oversight of gene editing that the Minister and her department propose, I know DEF was quite keen on it, and often cite sugar beet as an example of a target species for gene editing. The government have themselves said that they expect the sugar beet industry to no longer rely on bee-killing neonicotinoids by 2023, next year, through the development of pest-resistant varieties and greater use of integrated pest management. As a former lead for Labour on Farming, I've spoken up for our farmers when government policy on subsidy reform, labour or trade deals harms them. But I also feel it's need, we need to speak up for their environmental commitments, in particular the NFU's hard-won plan to hit net zero by 2040. This is an ambitious policy that means changing the way that farming works to be more sustainable, not just in terms of carbon, but water use, soil health, chemicals, and in particular, nature recovery. We can't have on one hand ministers saying, speaking of nature recovery, and on the other hand, green lighting the use of bee killing pesticides, whether as a spray or as a seed treatment, as they have in this respect. And this brings me to my main ask of ministers. I believe the government does not have the support of the public, the majority of beekeepers, all farmers, or I suspect the support of all their own MPs in authorising the use of bee-killing pesticides. So my proposal to the Minister is that future authorisations of bee-killing pesticides should be subject to a parliamentary vote. 
I would like this to be a vote where MPs have a genuine opportunity to weigh up the pros and cons of using neonicotinoids. I suspect the Minister would insist on a hard three-line whip for the bill for Conservative MPs, and sitting next to the uh, Deputy Chief Whip for the Labour side, I, I wouldn't want to guess what we might do on these situations, but I do think that MPs would think carefully about what to do. That saving the bees is such an important topic, but so is supporting our farmers, that MPs would consider that carefully. And the consequences of their vote would be carried by the Member of Parliament with a responsibility to persuade and explain to their constituents, responsibility to listen to their constituents. The climate and nature emergency is one of our defining issues of our time. How we respond to it and how we make it worse should require a democratic mandate and robust parliamentary scrutiny because we should be trying to resolve it. We should be trying to remove the problems. I hope the Minister will set out how she intends to invest in more robust scientific research to monitor the use of bee-killing pesticides by farmers and big sugar, as well as better protections against the need for it. Perhaps she will also be able to say what estimates she's made of how many bees and pollinators she expects will be killed by authorisation of these pesticides this year. What plan has she got for nature recovery in those areas where Cruiser SB, the neonicotinoid, will be used this year? And what monitoring will be in place over the next five years to fully understand the impact on bee and pollinator populations, importantly, not just in the fields where those crops are used, but in the hedgerows and the areas around those areas as well. And what steps will she put, uh, take to prevent the active ingredient of the pesticide, as the Bumblebee Conservation Trust describes it, leaching from the crop into wildflowers in and around the field margins? Some of the protections that have been built into the derogation are welcome, Raising the expected aphid incident level before the use of a treated seed permitted from a projected 7% to 19%, a 32-month ban on growing flowering crops in fields where sugar, treat, uh, sugar beet uh, has been grown up from 22 months last year, these are welcome. But I don't think they go far to justify the use of these pesticides. I don't want bee killing pesticides to be used ever, frankly. But if the Minister's argument is that they're only able to be used in emergencies, I want to challenge the Minister's assumption that this is an emergency. I expect the Minister will claim that there's no alternative to the authorisation of neonics that have taken place. I expect she will say UK sugar supplies will plummet and sugar beet farmers will suffer hugely and we would be forced as a nation to import more from abroad. Indeed, from countries where neonics are used. But I want to refer DEFRA to their own modelling. It says that predicted losses from sugar beet this year would have been under 10 million, even if no neonicotinoids were used. And that's assuming disease rates of over double what that was predicted last year. It's also assuming that farmers would not have used alternative mitigation strategies that we know many of them have been using. The government have them said, themselves said that they expect sugar beet uh, to industry to no longer rely on bee-killing chemicals by next year through the development of pest-resistant varieties and integrated pest management. That's welcome. But if it is coming, it doesn't come all at once. We know that there are strategies that have been put in place this year. So is it really an emergency? I want to see sugar beet farmers supported, but I don't believe the government has done enough to demonstrate that this is an emergency. Indeed, I think that the steps that the sugar beet uh, industry themselves and British Sugar and their growers have put in place has helped the pain share gain share. I think the, uh, the five tests that the government used to find an emergency are a bit woolly. I think being hidden away in assessments on the DEFRA website rather than put into the public domain does the government no favours as well. That's why an annual parliamentary vote on this is really important. We are in a climate and ecological emergency, but I don't believe we're in a sugar beet emergency. I support the farmers. Indeed, they're getting more support this year, and that's why I think it's important that we put the priority correctly on bees and, natures, bees and nature. But I would also like to challenge the minister to say that now is the time to update the national pollinator strategy that runs until 2024. I think that needs updating sooner than 2024. I'd be grateful if the Minister could look carefully at bringing that forward with a proper consultation about how more ambitious we can be to protect bees and pollinators. Um, Mr Roger, I look forward to contributions across the Chamber today. I think we all love bees and we all want to back our farmers. I think the only question is how we do that. This issue is hugely symbolic, not just because bees matter, but because it represents one of the first challenges that we have faced since the passing of the Environment Act about whether we can achieve a net zero and nature positive future. Being nature positive means more than planting just a few trees. It means taking tough decisions that may be unpopular with some because the benefits to nature outweigh the cost to some businesses. If we fall at such an early hurdle, 
on a species as popular as bees, how will we ever, how will we ever take the steps that we need to truly realise a future where England's green and pleasant lands are truly sustainable? That's why I think we must make a, a, a stand against the use of bee-killing pesticides. But I will also say this in political terms, and I make my intention clear. If the government wants to continue using bee-killing pesticides, we must make it politically impossible for them to do so. We must ensure that the public know that this is an annual decision that is taken. And for MPs of every party to be clear with their constituents about whether they support it or not. Because if we are to protect the bees and save the bees, we need to do more than just tweet about it, although I do that a lot. We do need to do more than just say those words. We need to ensure that it's in action. I think this needs to be a mo an annual moment of action, because if we don't, we won't secure that net zero nature positive future. Let's save the bees. Our planet depends on it. Thank you. <coughs> the question is that this House has considered government approval for the use of neonicotinoids and the impact on bees. There are... OK, I've seen it. That there are um, at least 11 members seeking to participate. There are only two front bench wind-ups. So by my reckoning, we've probably got about 45 minutes. Do the maths. Um, I'm not going to put a time limit on this, but if you take more than four minutes, somebody's not going to get in. Sir Robert Goodwill. Thank you, Sir Roger. And uh, I thank the Honourable Member opposite for uh, raising this topic as debate. Because it, this is a debate we need to have, and we need to focus on the facts um, I should declare I'm a farmer, although not a sugar beet farmer. Um, and indeed, I, I'm very fond of bees, not least because we grow field beans on our farm, we understand the role of, of pollinators. And we should not dispute the fact that neonicotinoids are toxic to bees in, in a sort of slightly more complex way than, than other toxins uh, can behave. Uh, so the, the behaviour of, of bees can be affected by them uh, and that can result in hives uh, actually you know, failing to, to, to survive. Um, and also I put on record as a farmer that you know, no farmer likes using pesticides. They're expensive uh, and, and they have an effect on the environment. And indeed, in many crops, such as, for example, wheat, uh, which can be affected by aphids, uh, you wait until a threshold of aphid uh, attack is reached before you use the, the sprays. In fact, you can, you can cope with a, a certain degree of predation as they feed on the, um, on the plant and, and, and suck the sap. However, if, if you're looking at a crop like winter barley, although it can have aphid attack in the growing season, you also have a disease called barley yellow dwarf virus, which is spread by a virus vector. So in the autumn, you spray your barley crop not because you've reached a threshold of, of aphid, but because you need to prevent that virus being spread. And the same situation occurs with sugar beet. So the, 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 the sugar beet virus yellows is, is, is caused by three uh, viruses, beet yellows virus, beet mild yellowing virus, and beet chlorosis virus. And that is spread by, a virus, uh, by an aphid vector. It's a bit like uh, mosquitoes uh, spreading uh, malaria. Uh, you know, one bite is enough to infect the plant. Uh, and, and therefore, farmers do need to protect that crop. And we've seen in, in a bad year that the crop can be uh, affected as much as 30% on the yield, sufficient to actually make the crop unviable to grow. Now, of course, sugar beet is a biennial, biennial crop. It does not flower in the first year. Uh, and indeed, using a seed dressing when you uh, plant the seed, so we're not talking about spraying it over the crop, we're not talking about bees flying around being affected. It actually renders the plant toxic at that critical stage. So if, if an aphid feeds on the plant, it dies and doesn't then spread uh, the virus uh, still further. And indeed, the, the peach potato aphid, our old friend Mises persicae, is the one that spreads it. As I say, uh, we, this isn't a problem solely uh, in the UK. We've seen 10 European Union countries apply for similar, similar derogations. Indeed, in, in France, uh, they have a derogation which will run until 2000. And 23. Now, that there are alternatives, but as the French uh, themselves said, none of them work well enough on their own uh, compared to the seed treatment. In fact, some of the alternatives um, that maybe wouldn't be good for the environment either. For example, you know, the virus overwinters on many uh, flowering weeds, um, and therefore you know, many farmers might be discouraged from putting in flower margins around their fields because that could overwinter the virus and then it could be spread into the crop. And, and as farmers, you know, we, we want to have our flower margins, we want to have a wide diversity on the crop. So I, I believe that this derogation is, 
is sensible. And because of the biennial nature of, of sugar beet, you know, we don't have bees feeding on pollen and nectar on the sugar beet crop in the same way as, as they would on a crop like field beans, beans, which is an annual crop. Could I also say a little bit about oilseed rape? We've seen a massive decline in oilseed rape in this country because we've lost the same type of seed treatment uh, which controls the cabbage stem flea beetle. Now, this isn't a virus vector, but at the very early stage when those first two cotyledon leaves emerge, the cabbage stem flea, flea beetle uh, will decimate the crop. And we've seen many farmers stop growing oilseed rape, which, of course, we then into the law of unintended consequence because oilseed rape is a massive source of pollen and nectar for those very bees that we want to encourage uh, and therefore, uh, I think that we need to be very careful that we don't just sort of go with the emotion. You know, we, we all love bees, we all want to protect bees, but we need to ensure that we actually have that diversity of break crops. Uh, and, and certainly as, as part of our new ELMS um, uh, system, you know, we want to have more uh, margins, we want to have more wildflowers, we want to have more diversity. But unfortunately, if we lose our two main break crops in the east of England, sugar beet and oilseed rape, we could result in the opposite happening. And of course, oilseed rape is drilled in August, mid-August. Uh, it grows through the winter and it doesn't flower until the following spring uh, when the residues are not sufficient. Uh, I think scientists uh, would, would make that point sufficient to cause problems with beer. So I, I think we need to be very careful that we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And I think it's very sensible for the government to allow a derogation, as 10 other EU countries have done, also we're not in the EU, so there are other EU countries, as 10 EU countries have done uh, to allow this to happen. I think that will secure the viability of the UK sugar beet industry. And also, I believe, not uh, affect bees. And I think the more research that can be done as we put in place these derogations, which only needed, by the way, if we have a mild winter and the aphids over winter, I think it's very sensible and I would support that. But as I say, I am a great champion for bees. Uh, but I think that, that many of the emails I get don't really take account of the science. We need to look at the science and the evidence. Uh, and, and I hope that uh, honourable and right honourable members will look at the science and realise this is a proportionate uh, change. Uh, and want, I think, that not only will um, uh, help the sugar beet industry in the UK. You know, we can, we can import sugar and we can stop producing sugar in this country. But I think it's important that we do, do so in a way that's proportionate and also does not uh, undermine our bee populations. Caroline Lucas. Thank you very much, uh, Sir Roger. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairship. And I also congratulate the Honourable Member for Plymouth, Sutton and Devonport for securing this debate. <clears throat> I'd like to make it clear that I do have enormous sympathy for farmers who have faced unprecedented challenges in recent years in responding to COVID, to Brexit and to increasingly unpredictable extreme weather events. And I completely understand their determination to protect their crops and their livelihoods. Nonetheless, I'm profoundly concerned about the government's emergency authorisation of Cruiser SB for 2022 to tackle the threat of yellow virus. Theomethoxam is a banned substance for a reason, and this decision is a retrograde move. It is utterly at odds with the government's legal requirement to halt species loss by 2030, <coughs> as set out in the Environment Act. And with COP15, the Global Biodiversity Summit, just months away, the government shouldn't, should be leading from the front to protect and restore nature, not giving a green light to the use of deadly toxins. Now, many members have already set out uh, the overriding scientific evidence of harm caused by these pesticides. And I would like to refer members back to December 2020, when I asked DEFRA what assessment had been made of the potential environmental effects of approving Cruiser SB Neonic in 2021. Now, as it transpires, as we know, the Neonic wasn't used last year because an especially cold winter led to a fall in aphid num numbers. But nonetheless, the then minister's reply assured me that the advice of the HSE and the Expert Committee on Pesticides was being sought and implied that it would be respected. The government's subsequent and continued disregard for the evidence presented by the very experts that it has appointed is at best mysterious and at worst utterly shameful. I'd also like to remind colleagues of the findings from the Environmental Audit Committee in their 2013 report on pollinators and pesticides. Now, I sat on that committee and still do, and particularly recall this recommendation, and I quote, DEFRA policy on pesticides must be evidence-based. Where the available scientific evidence is either incomplete or contradictory, DEFRA must apply the precautionary principle. Now, the government's decision to approve the use of this uh, neonic flies in the face of the evidence we do have, and it is not consistent with a precautionary approach. The government should be giving legal protection to bees and other pollinators. 
As it stands, pre-approval tests for pesticides focus only on short-term effects on honeybees, ignoring the long-term effects of pesticides on other wild pollinators altogether, the bumblebees, the beetles, and the moths on which we rely. Now, an amendment to the Environment Act sought to rectify this omission, but sadly did not win government support. The minister could right that wrong now and commit to making consideration of the long-term impacts of the UK's pesticide use on pollinators a mandatory requirement for the assessment process. This would also be an important first step towards embracing approach, a new approach to farming and pest management that works in harmony with nature, not against it. The government should be investing in innovative and non-chemical alternatives to pest management, including better forecasting, crop rotation, natural predators, and the use of resistant varieties, whilst at the same time supporting farmers to make the transition away from neonics. And that could be done, for example, via the Sustainable Farming Incentive in England and supporting nature-friendly pest control. So in conclusion, I'd like to quote from the Secretary of State's reply to a cross-party letter that I coordinated last year, in which he assured me that, and I quote, Emergency authorizations for pesticides are only granted in exceptional circumstances where diseases or pests can't be controlled by any other reasonable means. So can I ask the minister, what steps has the government taken over the last 12 months to support farmers to invest in these other reasonable control measures? I would love to know the details of that. Second, will she stop putting pollinators in persistent danger? Will she cancel the approval and instead spend the next 12 months ensuring that farmers can access non-chemical alternatives? And finally, will she commit to a national action plan to end the use of pesticides, putting UK nature on a genuine path to recovery? We're all saying how much we like bees. We heard from the uh, member that has just spoken saying how much he likes bees. But unless we're prepared to take action to put that into some kind of meaningful change, then it's just empty words. And with an environmental crisis, a nature crisis coming down the line at us, we cannot afford to do that. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Matthew Offord. Thank you, Mr. Gaines. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, under your chairmanship. And indeed, I congratulate the Honourable Member for Plymouth Sutton for bringing this debate this morning. I had a rather lengthy speech prepared, but I'm not going to give it. I'm just going to raise a few points to allow others to make their contributions. But, Mr. Gale, please don't interpret my brevity as indicating a lack of passion on this issue. The first point I wanted to make is that it's not just bees that are affected by neonicotinoids. It's also moths and butterflies who play an equally important role in natural habitats and food supply by pollinating crops and wild plants. Secondly, since the government agreed to the moratorium on the use of neonicotinoids, further studies have been published that confirm that neonics can be damaging to pollinators without being fatal. The chemicals may not necessarily result in death, but the impact on nervous systems and brains can make it difficult for such insects to function, such as the queen bee. This allows an assertion to be made that these chemicals don't kill pollinators, but that is incorrect. In addition to these unintended consequences, there are further reasons to ban the use of neonicotinoids, including contamination of the environment and the use of alternatives. Research conducted by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations reported the persistence of neonics in soil and water causing large-scale adverse effects on pollinators and concludes that they are still discovering the harmful effects of neonics. There is research published by Jack Tell Verhegen Thierry et al. in 2019 which has determined that an effective alternative to neonics was available in 96% of the 2,968 case studies they analysed. In 98%, neonics could be replaced with one non-chemical alternative, including microorganisms, semi-chemicals or surface coating of seed. The relevance of this lies in the pest feeding habits. Leaf and flower feeders are easier to control with non-chemical methods, whereas wood and rock feeders are more difficult to manage in the same way. The conclusion is that non-chemical alternatives to neonics do exist, but it will take Her Majesty's Government to promote them through regulation and funding. Now, justification has previously been made about the application of a previous derogation in 2020, and that was that 25% of the national crop of sugar beet was lost, resulting in over £65 million for the growers and processes of the sugar beet. But in the Environmental Audit Select Committee that the Honourable Lady for Brighton Pavilion and myself both served on in 2013, the Pollinators and Pesticides Report, we made a very clear recommendation that economic considerations should not form part of environmental risk management decision-making. 
but rather should be a function of a distinct and transparent subsequent political process. And this approach now appears to have been ignored. For many years, people have said that DEFRA is not taking a sufficiently precautional approach. So I appeal to the Minister today, please don't make this further evidence uh, of that assertion to be true. Laura Anderson. the member for Plymouth, Sutton and Devonport, on, in bringing forward this very important debate and raising awareness about decisions that are being made in secret. Um, it's developed by many of my constituents in Putney who've written to me about bees. We certainly have some, we may be an urban constituency in Putney, but we do have beehives um, on the Granville Road allotments, for example, and Albert Road. We have delicious honey from Southfields, which I have every year. And there is interest in this debate across the country for many reasons. I'm very concerned about this decision, not only for the immediate impact it will have on the environment, but also for the way the decision is being made and what it shows about the attitude towards the Environment Bill, which I feel, I was on the Bill Committee, I feel the ink is only just dry on that, and yet it's being set aside. And for the attitude being taken towards expert advice, following the science is absolutely what we should be doing, but I don't think this decision has followed the science I'm concerned about the damage to bees and aquatic life and the, the damage of the influence of the runoff from um, the use of the insect um, nic neonicotinoids. I'm, I'm concerned that support for farmers hasn't been sufficiently taken into account because it does exist. And I'm concerned about abandoning the precautionary principle, which has been mentioned by other members earlier, but which is absolutely fundamental to our environmental decision-making. But if it's not even being put in place right now, straight after we've agreed the Environment Bill, what will happen to it in the future? We need to reassert the precautionary approach. The government's case rests on two justifications, and I absolutely sympathise and understand the situation of sugar beet farmers at the moment. The the government's case will rest on the financial impact on farmers. But the latest contracts between growers and British Sugar has included an insurance scheme to offset possible losses on the occurrence of the virus, of the virus yellows. And this needs to be considered in the context of the case for need. Sugar beet farmers have been, and the, the impact of their financial loss has been taken into consideration. And secondly, the government will say, and I'm sure the minister will say, that there's a very limited use for this insecticide and it's not on flowering plants and there will be restrictions on what can be grown in the contaminated soil for 32 months. I welcome all of those restrictions um, but I think it should go further because the UK Expert Committee on Pesticides has considered exactly this question and they've concluded the environmental risk especially of runoff into water and back into plants animals and flower other flowering plants in the surrounding areas of the fields is too great in their meeting on the 21st of September 2021, they concluded that the requirements for emergency authorisation have not been met. They cannot support the recommendation. They were specifically asked to look into the impacts on the risk of honeybees and any other additional measures that could be implemented to mitigate. Instead of saying there was a very low impact on honeybees, which there was directly, um, and there could be some additional measures implemented to mitigate. They said no, they could not recommendation, recommend that this ban should be lifted. They said there is new evidence regarding the risk from neonicotinoids globally, which adds weight to the evidence of the Im adverse impact of honeybee behaviour and demonstrated negative impacts on bee colonies. They said further evidence has been published on the occur occurrence of thiamethoxam in honey and of adverse effects on other bee species and these should be considered in addition to the chronic effects on honeybees. And they said none of the suggested mitigation measures, which the Minister I'm sure will be laying out and I've had in response to questions, none of these suggested mitigation measures protected off-crop areas. And if the authorisation is granted, further consideration needs to be given as to how this could impact growers involved in agri-environmental schemes and which involve planting flowering margins. The, their conclusion is that they are unable to support emergency authorisation under Article 53 of Regulation 1107-2009 because of the reasons laid out by the Health and Self Safety Executive, the expected off-crop environmental effects and the impact of grower contract changes on the trigger threshold for use. It's absolutely unacceptable that the government should just say they will take into account 
expert panels, set up an expert panel, have the meeting in good time, have the, at the same time as we are having COP26, hosting COP26, approving the Environment Bill, which has the precautionary um, in, impact built in, and then disregard it straight away. One, I'd just like to highlight, yes. Um, just on that point, and the uh, Honourable Member is making excellent points and an impassioned speech. I think that it's really um, important that we set out quite clearly that the science has been set out and the uh, panel has been, has been spoken to, but the government are not only not being cautious, they are being reckless in the, their dismissal of that panel's uh, views. I absolutely agree with my honourable friend. I could go on longer about the precautionary principle, but I don't have enough time. But it was set out in the 1992 Rio Conference on the Environment. It's absolutely essential that we consider that. Also, the impact on bees has been well documented. The nic nicotinoids can damage the receptors to the insect's nervous system, stopping their, including paralysis. It affects learning, feeding, foraging, reproduction, and eventually kills the insect. This is what the public want us to see, saving the bees, saving our environment, increasing biodiversity. I would like to conclude with some questions to the Minister. Why did the Minister disregard the advice of the expert panel? What is the Minister doing to stop the effect of runoff if the ban is lifted and these neonicotinoids are being used? What support is the Minister giving to sugar beet farmers to enable them to tackle virus yellows without the use of neonicotinoids rather than coming back year by year to, to lift this ban. What research is the Minister doing into the declining bee population in the UK, and how can we save them instead of killing them? And what and research is being done on the effects of neonicotinoids, particularly on bees, and the effect of lifting the ban on or around the fields affected? When will the Government update the pollinator strategy, and can we have an annual vote on lifting any bans so that we can be absolutely held account for the decisions that we make that have a, such a big impact on the environment. Thank you. Dr Caroline Johnson. Um, I think we can all agree on three things. I think we can all agree that bees are very important and we should protect them. I think we could all agree that we've eaten something containing sugar in the last <laughs> 24 hours. <laughs> and we can all agree that the government has to consider competing risks and balance them carefully. With regard, to, um, with regard to bees and the agreement that they're important, the government has developed a pollinator strategy. Its um, new environmental land management schemes for farmers encourage um, the growing of areas which um, bees can find safe habitat, incre increases the number of uh, other areas for habitat for bees, increases the public awareness of, of the needs of bees, and increases the understanding of health and disease in bees in order that we can manage those more effectively. And I welcome all of that. Competing, not, well, not competing with that, but as well as that, we have to consider the importance of sugar. Sugar is responsible for, production of sugar is responsible for 9,500 jobs in the UK. Many of them are in my constituency. I should at this stage mention, Mr Chair, that my husband is a farmer, although this is the first time in 45 years that there will be no sugar grown on, uh, on, on the farm. Um, there are also 7,000 businesses in the sugar supply lane. And we have 3 million tonnes of sugar consumed in the UK every year. Now, I appreciate that the government is investing in um, things to try and in ensure that we have pest-resistant varieties so that no chemicals will be needed because the virus shadows won't be able to attack the uh, sugar beet. But, of course, these are not available yet. And we had the awful um, uh, time in 2020, just two years ago, and I remember being called by many constituents to look around their fields and see whole fields of crops that had turned yellow because of the virus yellows. And the, the, you know, the farmers have spent many months growing and tending to those crops only to find that they fail. Um, so the government has to look at the risk, the various risks and say, OK, so what, what is the alternative? Okay? If our sugar crop fails, what do we have to do? Well, we could import sugar beets. We could import it from, ba from Belgium, from France, from Denmark, from Spain, or one of the other 12 European countries where we grow sugar beet and they also use neonics, often without the restrictions that the government has proposed to replace on these. I've heard m members to this morning mention net zero and the effect on net zero, but actually, let's think about the other alternative, to import, a, to import sugar cane from overseas. What about the deforestation? 
Most, most sugar beet is not irrigated, it is just fed by the rain, but sugar cane, because of where it's grown, usually has to be irrigated. That's a 60% water use saving. What about the, the food miles? We know that sugar grown in the UK travels an average of 28 miles to the factory to be processed into sugar. It's many thousands of miles and a much greater use of CO2 to import it many miles across the world. What we can't do when we're making environmental um, judgments is simply export, take the moral high ground and export the harm overseas because we all live on the same planet and I'm sure we would agree we all need to protect it. So what are, what are the farmer's alternatives if, if neonics is banned? Well, either not to grow sugar and to import it as above or to use alternative legal pesticides which may be broader spectrum and potentially actually uh, more harmful. May I interview? Yes, of course. For allowing this intervention, and uh, you're making an excellent speech, uh, and you're particularly mentioning farmers. Now, my constituency of Arnest Morn has got strong beekeeping community represented by the Anglesey Beekeepers Association, many local honey producers, including Anglesey Bees, Melmorn, and Verlin Honeybees, run by Katie Hayward. But my question is Does my honourable friend uh, agree with me that our farmers are key? They're key that any chemicals, including nicotinoids, are used correctly in order to protect the bee population. Thank you, absolutely. And I think we need to remember that bees are very important to farmers. I mean, uh, my honourable friend from Scarborough and Whitby um, made very clear the, um, the importance of bees to farmers. And it's absolutely right that farmers do not wish to use pesticides they do not, do not need. But equally, they also do not wish to see their entire crop fail, uh, and, and nor do we need to need, wish the alternative of importing crops from overseas, where potentially worse pesticides may have been used. So the government needs to ban balance the risk, and I think it has done so very carefully in this situation. Um, Firstly, there needs to be a threshold of virus yellow predictions for the, for the year, and indeed there was a derogation like this given last year, but these, the treatment was never the seed treatments were never used because the threshold of virus yellow disease was not reached. The application is a seed treatment, which means it's not sprayed onto a flowering crop and potentially landing on bees as they fly past. It's a treatment put onto the seeds, um, which, then, which then have that protection at the early growth phase. It's also um, not allowed for, this, for the flowering plants to be grown in that field for 32 months, thus providing additional um, protection to the crop. So on balance, Mr Chair, I believe it's important we always take an evidence and science-based approach, looking at the potential risks and benefits. Science will ultimately resolve this problem by providing a disease and pest-resistant varieties, but in the meantime, I'm glad that the government has taken a proportionate and pragmatic response. Kerry McCarthy. congratulate my honourable friend from Plymouth, Sutton and Devonport for securing this debate. Um, I thought the note that the um, honourable member just ended on was, was an interesting one because the, the actual whole point of this debate is that the government isn't following the science. We've had the expert committee on pesticides and the health and safety executive have told the government that the conditions for the use of these pesticides have not been met and the government um, has, has chosen to um, exploit the loophole and to ignore the experts. And for those of us that were involved in what seemed like endless discussions about the Environment Bill, pre-legislative scrutiny, committees, all, it seems like there was a second reading every other day at, at one point, or, um, and the Agriculture Bill as, as, as well. Um, we were always worried about this. We were worried that the government didn't want to support the precautionary principle, didn't want to see it embedded in law. And it's why Labour tried to amend the Environment Act to give Parliament the power to scrutinise these decisions, and the case has been made for that parliamentary scrutiny by a number of members today, but that was voted down by the government. We know how dangerous these pesticides are to bees. Um, we, we've heard, and I don't want to reiterate all, all the arguments, but when exposed to neonicotinoids in low doses, their immune systems are harmed, making them susceptible to disease. They disrupt the abilities of bees to navigate, forage, and reproduce. And in high doses, they cause paralysis and death. There's also research showing that pesticides become more dangerous when combined, including those pesticides that are specifically marketed as being safe for bees. And we've also heard why pollinators, which has, has been said isn't just bees, it includes flies, wasps, beetles, butterflies, moths and bats, um, are so important. 75% of our crop species require pollination. Um, they're crucial in fertilising plants and sustaining our food systems. In China, they've had to resort to pollinating fruit trees by hands because the pollinators have been nearly wiped out by pesticide use. And you know, that really should serve as a warning to us. 
but as we've heard, there's been a drastic decline in pollinators here too, falling by over 50% between 1985 and 2005. Um, the Honourable Member for Brighton Pavilion spoke a bit about um, agroecology and, and that sort of approach to farming and organisations like the Soil Association, which is based in Bristol, have been highlighting the dangers of pesticides and promoting alternatives for years, um, arguing you know, that if nature is properly harnessed to pollute crops organically and to deal with pests, rather than relying on destructive pesticides that harm biodiversity, you would actually find that crop yields would, would be higher. And the evidence has shown that where you do have these margins with wildflowers and so on and the pollinators, that does... Um, uh, increased crop yields. The sugar beet sector has said there would no longer be a need for neonics um, by 2023 if inter integrated pest management approaches can be adopted instead. So I would ask the Minister, as the Honourable Member for Brighton Pavilion said, what is the government doing to support this as an alternative to reliance on pesticides? I do just want to mention, it's not just pollinators that are at risk from the use of pesticides. Otters were nearly wiped out in the 1970s due, due to their use. And thankfully, otter populations have recovered since those pesticides were banned, but they are still under threat from other so-called forever chemicals, such as PFASs, um, which are accumulating... In, um, I'm very grateful to my honourable friend, and she's making a very well-informed speech, as always. There seems to be some doubt between... Uh, various members that where the balance of science in all this lays mm -hmm. and my honourable friend for Plymouth Devonport and my honourable friend for Putney both indicated that the science doesn't back the position uh, the government's taken. Does my honourable friend agree with that? Yeah, I agree. Well, this is the point we've heard from the experts. The experts have said that the case has not been made. And, um, you know, I know the government has been quite dismissive of, of experts in, in the past. But, you know, that is the case. Why, why, what is the point of asking expert opinion if the government doesn't abide by it? Um, I do suspect that in the, um, her response, the minister will tell us that about how the Environment Act commits us to reverse biodiversity decline by 2030. Um, perhaps she could tell us how allowing neonicotinoids um, and the use of pesticides will help. She may also point to how the Agriculture Act will reward farmers who try to increase biodiversity on their farms. But we heard in yesterday's debate in here that the government is making a mess of introducing elms. Later this year, the Convention on Biological Diversity will meet in China. It's very unclear, and this is my final question, I don't really know what the government hopes to achieve from the UK's participation, but perhaps it would be an idea um, to go along to promote the precautionary principle, pledge to ditch the pesticides, protect our pollinators, and genuinely promote biodiversity. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Sir Roger. Many in the farming community support nature recovery, and they understand that um, really business as usual is no longer acceptable. So in this balance, what they really need is support, the support of government to work towards nature recovery. My parents-in-law used to have bees, four hives at some point. Um, they were very much part of the family. They lived at the end of the garden um, uh, in that instance to protect them from our children's ball games. Um, but I have to, I've come to know these wonderful and highly civilized creatures who work incredibly hard on our behalf, we should put a very high value on them. And I know how vulnerable they are to our human interference. The use of pesticides, neonicotinoids on crops, has, has an extremely damaging effect on the mobility of bees. Its use was banned by the EU in 2018. The government originally agreed, but promised and promised it would uh, reintroduce its use only when the scientific evidence changed. But despite no new evidence now, the use of pesticides has been allowed again. The government should make the protection of our wildlife and the environment a priority rather than going back on its words. And the government is using Brexit not as it likes us to believe for the advantage of people in our environment, but quite the opposite removing important decisions for its protection. Many organizations, many of my constituents in Bath, Sir Roger, have reached out to me with their great concerns over this issue and the lack of consideration 
behind it. The expert committee on pesticides, as we've already heard today, warned how damaging neonicotinoids are for bees and aqua uh, aquatic life, but the government has chosen to ignore them. This is not acceptable. In April 2021, I asked the Secretary of State for DEFRA whether government encouraged the use of alternatives to neonicotinoids, to which the answer was that the government was completely committed to reducing the use of pesticides. But in the same session, 10 minutes later, uh, the Secretary of State said, until a suitable alternative to neonicotinoids is found, the government will continue to grant dispens dispensations to the use of it. There you have it. Words of woolly aspirations, but when it comes to the crunch, the government actively supports what I would call the gradual extinction of the UK's bee population. The long-term harmful effects of this careless attitude will be felt by all of us, as it has huge implications on our food supplies. It is paramount that this government wakes up and imposes much tighter restrictions on the use of neonicotinoids rather than standing by and be complicit in the degradation of our wildlife and the quality of our environment and the long-term security of our food supplies. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah, well Ian Greenman. Thank you, Sir Roger. It's a pleasure yeah. to see you in the chair this morning. As we've heard loud and clear, my honourable friend for Plymouth Sutton and Devonport loves bees. I congratulate him on securing today's debate and for the passionate, knowledgeable and eloquent case he made on her behalf their behalf. Bees need protection. In the last half century, half of Britain's bee, butterfly and moth species have declined. In the last 30 years, three bumblebee species have become extinct. And right now, almost one in 10 species of wilder bee face extinction. This cannot continue. Bees are our friends. Almost a third of the food that we eat relies on pollination, mainly by bees. That work, pollinating crops by these notoriously industrious insects, is worth millions of pounds each year. If we didn't have wild pollinators to do this vital work for us, it would cost around £1.8 billion each year. We need to speak up for our bees because we need them. They're not only essential for our farming system, but also ensure the diversity of our wild plants and have a vital role in sustaining the natural habitats that we know and love. As my constituent Hilary told me when she asked me attend to attend today, this matter affects all our lives. So, Roger, very many of my constituents worry about the ecological emergency we face. They wanted me to speak up for protecting our bees and to oppose the government's plans that threaten their future. My constituent, Judith, tells me I have a wildlife garden and I've noticed the stark decline in the number of bees in recent years. She's right to be concerned. We cannot afford to put our bee populations at additional risk. I will give way. I thank my honourable friend for giving way and um, would she um, join with me in congratulating the Flourish at Ward Way, a community and environmental garden project in my constituency in Upton that do fantastic work uh, with beef friendly gardening, keeping hives and producing fantastic honey. And would she agree with the concerns raised by my constituents who've drawn attention to research by academic and author Professor David Goulson who's warned that just a single teaspoon of this type of chemical is enough to kill 1.25 billion honeybees equivalent to four honey, uh, lorry loads. I thank my honourable friend for her intervention. I think she made a very important uh, point which will be valuable in this debate. As many honourable members have said, bees are already under threat as a direct result of the way we live, we use land and farm, including the reuse of pesticides and particularly neonicotinoids. Whilst we've known for many years that neonics have a harmful effect on bees and other pollinators, recent studies have only confirmed and strengthened that evidence. As the Food and Agriculture Organisation of the UN have said, there is a consensus over the need to restrict their use. Now, as an EU member, the UK was part of creating a strict regime to regulate the use of these pesticides. An almost total ban was put in place in 2018 because of the damage that these chemicals caused to bees. The then Environment Secretary said the government supported the move as we could not afford to put our pollinator population at risk. Now, those protective regulations are still part of retained law in Great Britain, but now the government are authorising the use of a bee-killing uh, pesticide. This is a clear betrayal of promises given during debates on the Environment Bill, when we were assured that the government would only strengthen the protection of nature. 
My constituent Stuart worries that the government wants to rescind this protection to prove that the UK has more freedom after Brexit. I'm sure he's wrong, and I'm certain that no one voted for the freedom to kill bees. And, of course, the government itself claims that a benefit of Brexit is halting the decline in nature and strengthening our environmental regulation. But those words, for those words to mean something, uh, it can't allow the use of neo-nicks because that's not consistent with them. Of course, UK farmers need our support. And especially living in Nottinghamshire, I understand the importance of sugar beet production, but we cannot afford to take this risk with our precious pollinators, ignoring the government's own scientific uh, advice, especially when the Environment Secretary himself has admitted that it is not possible to rule out completely a degree of risk to bees. My constituent Christopher worries that with the country still entrenched in the battle against COVID and the headline-grabbing scandals of the PM, it must be easy to forget the long-term policies that affect our natural world. So, Roger, we all share in a huge responsibility to protect our environment for future generations. Government must help our food producers to farm sustainably and invest in resistant crops. It's not too late to reverse this bad decision. Ministers can and must think again, maintain the ban on neonics and save our bees. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. James Wilde. Thank you very much, Lord Chair. The Honourable Member for securing this debate. I rise to join the love-in for bees and also to highlight the issues faced by sugar beet growers and processors in my northwest Norfolk constituency. Those growers in Norfolk, Lincolnshire, Nottinghamshire and other parts of the country saw yields hit by 25% in 2020 and in some cases the loss was as much as 80% due to virus yellows. As has been mentioned, that represents a hit to the sector of £65 million. Now, I've met with growers in my constituency, like my honourable friend. I've seen the damage that virus yellows does. And given, given the dramatic loss of crop, an emergency authorisation application was made in, 2020, in 2021 and granted. But there's a deliberately a high bar for doing so. Before being granted, the government has to consider five tests. There need to be special circumstances. There must be a danger. There can be no reasonable alternative. It must be necessary and subject to limited and controlled use. Those are rightly tough tests. And as my honourable friend, the member for Scarborough and Whitby said, it's important to recognise that sugar beet is a non-flowering crop, so it's not attractive to bees, the bees that we all love. In 2021, the conditions attached to that emergency authorisation included a forecast of virus levels of 9%, which was not met, and so no neonics were used. This year, the government has toughened that test, so there would need to be a virus level of 19%. Furthermore, no flowering crop can be planted in the same soil for 32 months. So this is a very limited authorisation. It is an insurance policy which may well not end up being used, as happened last year. Ultimately, we need to move away from neonics. I think everyone would agree with that. And British Sugar, the NFU, the British Beet Research Organisation are all working on alternatives to tackle virus yellows through non-chemical alternatives, through gene editing, integrated pest management, and improving national, natural resistance in the crop. Yeah, I, I, I write to support my honourable friend and also to speak on behalf of the many sugar beet growers in my constituency, which he knows well because we are neighbours. It's absolutely right to say, as he's emphasised, there can be a, uh, an agreement between those who want to balance nature, who want to produce crops, but also care about the environment, care about bees, care about the diversity which bees are at the heart of. And we shouldn't create a paradox, a, an artificial distinction between those who farm and grow and those who care about wildlife and nature. My honourable friend makes a, a very important point. Um, farmers in my constituency, they love bees, they love the pollinators. And they are working on alternatives and I want to see those alternatives come forward more rapidly so that further authorisations are not needed in the future. Thank you, Mr. Shuman. And first of all, can I uh, thank you for calling me? Uh, congratulate the Honourable Gentleman for uh, Plymouth, Sutton and Davenport for coming this forward. As a constituency MP with a rural area, I've worked to raise awareness of this issue for some time now. And as a landowner, I've been, uh, uh, I have been interested in this. And finally, as a grandfather, I've invested in the need to get it right when it comes to our bees and ecosystems. I'm very fortunate, Mr. Shuman, uh, to, to uh, have uh, neighbours, Christopher and Valentine Hodges, uh, who have introduced uh, beehives on our farm. 
uh, and Grey Abbey and the constituency of Strangford. Uh, they are introducing uh, uh, the black bee. It's a species that, that's under some threat, uh, and the fact that they are doing this is something we should be very, very uh, uh, gracious for. Uh, the consensus is emerging over the need to restrict the use of the of the uh, NNIs. And the fact is that without pollen leaders, we cannot eat and will die. We need to restrict the use, and it must happen now. The, the, can I very quickly, Mr Chairman, uh, conscious of your direction, the protocol ensures that while Great Britain has now operated a se separate regime that began on the 1st of January 2021, they are able to diverge from EU decisions when it comes to pesticide approval. Could I ask the Minister, as I often do, uh, what discussions, and will she enter into discussions with the Minister, uh, the FCDO Minister, who is responsible for uh, the issues of the Northern Ireland Protocol, and with the DERA Minister at the Northern Ireland Assembly? However, what this debate again explains is that the Northern Ireland Protocol is not simply a matter of little extra postage paid or additional form to be filled in. It's a matter of grave importance to our regulations and environment in Northern Ireland. There can and should be no divergence UK-wide. We should all take the issue of pesticides uh, seriously, debate it together as we are today, and apply the result UK-wide to everywhere. Currently, my constituents have no vote and no voice as to these regulations, which affect their food intake and future security. And this beggars belief. To conclude, Mr Chairman, uh, I'm a great believer that bees should be appreciated, respected and protected. From my time as a child in my aunt Isabel's garden, uh, marvelling at the, one, the wonder of honeycomb in the 1960s and where my love of honey came from, to becoming a man and understand the vital role, role played by the humble bee, I, I have learnt this lesson and the absence of indisputable proof to the contrary. NNI pesticides are dangerous and harmful in the long term to our environment, food security and indeed our future. I work with a councillor uh, in the Arsborough Council, the UP, UUP councillor, but he's also a farmer, and I use his words to conclude with. He used to make it clear that when the bees are gone, we are gone. And with that in mind, I think we must do all we can to prevent this happening and robust that the NNI regulations play a massive part in this and should subsequently be retained and implemented in UK law. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Finally, from the back bench is Margaret Greenwood, please. Thank you, Sir Roger. I appreciate you calling me to speak in this very important debate. Um, I've received a great deal of correspondence from constituents about the government's authorisation of an emergency application in England for the use of Cruises SB pesticide, which contains Theomethoxam and neocannabinoid. I share their concerns, not least because the government has not heeded the conclusions of the Health and Safety Executive and its own expert committee on pesticides that found the requirements for an emergency authorisation had not been met and that pollution from the pesticide would dam damage river life. As the Wildlife Trust has pointed out, these neonicotinoids will have a devastating impact on pollinators, wildflowers and waterways at a time when nature needs to be urgently put into recovery. The government has even accepted as recently as last December that there is a growing weight of scientific evidence that neonicotinoids are harmful to bees and other pollinators. So why have ministers gone ahead and granted this authorisation? Some of my constituents have highlighted the crucial role that bees play in maintaining a healthy environment. One constituent made the specific point that by allowing the use of deathly pesticides, the UK government undermines the urgency and incentive to invest in and implement alternative, less harmful control methods. This perhaps ties in with a point which the RSPB made concerning the importance of upholding the ban on highly toxic pesticides like neonics and instead working to support our farmers to, in reducing their reliance on these harm, harmful chemicals. As one of my constituents has asked, how can the UK government approve using such material? It goes against all common sense and scientific reason. Clearly, this is something that many rural West residents care passionately about, and I'd like to put on record that I share their concerns. The Wildlife Trust has been very clear that they believe the government's authorisation is short-sighted. They have expressed their opinion that by authorising the use of neonics, the UK government is damaging its own ability to meet the legal requirement contained in the Environment Act to halt and reverse the decline of nature by 2030. This is because pollinators such as bees are vital to enhancing biodiversity, and without thriving populations of pollinators, the UK we will struggle to halt the decline of other species. I would very much welcome the Minister's comments on that specific point because it's an important one and I feel the Minister should address it this morning. In conclusion, I would urge the Government to listen to the concerns of wildlife charities, many of which echo the views of my constituents, to listen to, to, listen to the views of own experts and to think again. Thank you for the opposition. Daniel Zeitner, please. Thank you, Sir Roger. It's a pleasure to serve with you in the Chair. And, um, can I say just how grateful I am to my honourable friend and member for Plymouth Sutton Devonport for bringing this debate. We know that his love of bees is legendary and I thought that his introduction to this debate um, tackled a series of very complicated issues very thoroughly and very effectively, as did all the contributions this morning. 
I think there is a big question for the Minister to answer at the, end of, at the end of this, is why has this decision been made? And I look forward to her answering that question. But the other thing that comes, strikes me as coming through very loud and clear is there's a strong sense that farming and the environment must not be seen as being in conflict. They have to be done together. We have to find ways of making it work. I think so many of us have so many emails from our constituents on this subject, and we can see by the attendance in the chamber this morning. I should say at the outset I'm a species champion for the rude rural bumblebee, who sadly I've still not met, but I'm looking for one. Um, and like many other <laughs> Cambridgeshire MPs, they're quite rare, and of course that is a significant point. Um, like other Cambridgeshire MPs, I'm a, um, a vice president of the Cambridgeshire Beekeepers Association. Um, and in my first flush of enthusiasm as a newly elected member, I turned up at their AGM, which completely nonplussed them, and I haven't embarrassed them since. But I think what it shows is that we all care about bees. I also know that one of the first speeches I made in this place back in 2015 was a, a, a debate on this very subject. And one always, of course, looks back nervously um, to see what one said, particularly when one picks up a brief much later on. And I was delighted to find that my final words were that we should listen to science and ensure that bees and farmers can flourish both matter. And I must say right at the outset also that I do understand how farmers feel at the moment. They feel from my conversations with them so often that the tools that they need for the job are being systematically taken away. And that is a very difficult for them, thing for them to do because nature does not compromise. The problems keep coming and if you haven't got the tools to deal with those problems it is really, really hard. Um, but um, as I've said from the beginning in this speech and before, for us, pollinator health is just not negotiable. This is not something that can be traded off, and I think that is a theme that's come through many, many of the contributions. But I listened closely um, to the contributions, um, particularly from those who represent um, the East of England. I'm an East of England MP. I know how many jobs are at stake. The member um, for North West Norfolk made this point um, very clearly. Huge number of jobs, very, very important to local economy, and we had to find ways of making that work. I have to say, also looking back to the 2015 debate, I did notice there was one speaker who followed me, and she said, this is, not, this is about not taking risks. The lesson to learn from DDT is that we must not take risks. I asked the minister, please, not to take unnecessary risks with the environment and human health. Not the current minister who's sitting there, but actually one of her colleagues. And I just reflect the fact that um, uh, all of us, and she also contributed to that debate at the time. That, 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 that debate at the time was much more about OLC rape, quite frankly, and cabbage stem flea beetle. It's now moved on to theomots um, and sugar beet. Um, and I think it shows that already um, a lot has been done. But I have to say, looking back at the debate over the last couple of years, last year I don't think the government covered itself in glory because the HSE advice, which is available this year, um, wasn't so easily available last year. It took Friends of the Earth... Um, to, take, uh, to use freedom of information tests. It took some testy exchanges at DEFRA questions that the Minister may re remember. Um, I appreciate that the bar has been set higher this year, but I have to say, talking to the experts of Roth Hampstead, and that doesn't necessarily mean uh, that, it w that th they will be that dramatically different if the weather's different. Mm -hmm. And of course, last year we were saved by the cold weather. This year, I have to say at this point, it does not look like that's going to come to the rescue. Key question, though, is the Secretary of State has ignored the expert advice, and we heard that clearly from the introduction from my honourable friend, the member for Plymouth, Sutton and Devonport, the member for Brighton Pavilion, the member for Putney, the member for Bristol East, the member for Wirral West. Virtually everyone has asked that question. Why has the advice been overridden? And for those um, who found them, their way through um, those lengthy reports, including the Cruiser SP application, and found their way to page 193, it is absolutely clear this test is not considered to be met. Now, I don't I'm not going to take you through the 193 pages, sir, but actually there's a, there's a simpler account from the um, expert committee on pesticides. They come to the same conclusion, but they also had an extra one, which I think is worth just um, pulling out, given some of the contributions that have been made. They say none of the suggested mitigation measures protected off crop areas, and if the alteration is granted, further consideration needs to be given how this could impact on growers involved in agri-environmental schemes which involve planting flowering margins. And that point has been made on a number of occasions. And I do not see that that has been um, properly addressed. I also have to say, if you look back at some of the history of this, these, these debates, there have been many academic studies, 
There have been um, many reports written. I was particularly struck um, by one um, produced by Bug Life, um, written by Matt Shardler, a very detailed account a few years ago. And this comes to the point about runoff, because something which hasn't been raised in this debate so far is this is not just about cruiser SP. There are actually folia uh, neonicotinoid sprays that are also being authorised. I think um, Biscaya and Insist. Um, so there is a real, real risk of this, uh, these chemicals getting into the water. And I was particularly struck by uh, uh, the uh, impact on the River Waveney. And in that report, so the River Waveney was the most heavily polluted river exceeding the average annual chronic pollution limit. I think this is relevant given the interest people have in, in river quali water quality in rivers at the moment. Not just the Waveney, but the Wensum. And I have to say, for me, it was particularly personal because that was a, a, um, a measurement taken in, at Ellingham Mill where my parents used to live. So for people in the east of England, this really, um, really matters. So the question is, why has the Secretary of State made this decision? I thought the member for Hendon made an important point um, about uh, the economics behind this. It's got to be about economics. Hasn't it? It's the only, the only explanation. In fact, DEFRA produced um, something which I don't, I'm not sure perhaps most people have seen, a very detailed economic uh, analysis on the impacts of virus yellows on sugar beet production. Um, again, I'm, I don't have the time to go out into it in detail, but it, it shows that over a six-year average, um, there's a potential 14.4 million loss, and reference has already been made to 2020, which was a, a particularly hard year. So, of course, there is an economic issue, but it, as has been rightly said by a number of members, there are other alternatives too, and clearly people are working on them. And, yes, the peach potato aphid is a real menace, there's no doubt about it, but there are ways in which um, it can be tackled through integrated pest management, through better rotation, through better husbandry. None of this is easy. And, of course, it's not consistent. It's not the same everywhere. Um, different people get different results, and it's all very unpredictable. But it also has to be put in the context, and, again, this is a point well made, I think, by the member for Bristol East about the, the potential threat to pollinator health. Look at the value that pollinators bring um, to our economy. I think estimated at some 430 million to, or to 603 million to UK agriculture in general. So, in conclusion... Uh, Mr Gale, this is not simple. These are tough decisions for farmers. It's a gamble in many ways, trying to judge the weather, trying to judge when the aphid will fly, trying to judge whether the, if you plant too early you're going to lose the sugar beet, etc., etc. It is an economic argument. British sugar, as we have heard, um, is a very viable business. It makes money. It actually has, of course, um, through the Virus Yellows Assurance Scheme, already gone down the road of providing some compensation, some way of pooling the risk on this. And I would just conclude that at the end of all this, we know that bee health is really non-negotiable. So why on earth, why on earth has the Secretary of State chosen to overrode all the expert advice? Mr Gale, we would make a different decision. And I think that decision would not only be better for bees, I actually think it would be better for farmers as well as we create a nature-positive vision for the future. Yeah, yeah. Mr Victoria Prentice. Sir Roger, it's a great pleasure to serve with you in the chair, particularly as I think you'd rather have been speaking in this debate. I congratulate as well the Honourable Gentleman for um, organising this debate and so many members for taking part in this really important discussion this morning. I should probably declare my interest too. We have two hives of bees, bees at home and they are an integral part of our orchard management for my apple and pear crop in particular. Let me set out the problem. We all eat and enjoy sugar, some of us rather more than we should. 63% of the sugar that the UK consumes is made from homegrown sugar beet and we had an interesting debate in this chamber yesterday about um, food security and it's important to remember that. Sugar beet seedlings are very vulnerable to aphid predation. The aphids spread the devastating virus yellows, which can seriously reduce both the quantity and the quality of the crop. The disease is more widespread in certain years, particularly after mild winters. Previously, as we've heard, neonics were used as the pesticide to tackle the problem. We banned their use outside in 2018, 
at the same time as the EU. This was because of a growing body of academic evidence that they could be damaging to bees and other pollinators. This affected my farm personally in respect to oilseed rape growing. We've grown the crop since 1974, but we no longer do so. In this, we're not alone. The planted area of oilseed rape is not much more than half the level than it used to be before neonics were last used. However, there is a very significant difference. I won't if you don't mind. I have a great deal to get through. All seed rape is significantly different from beet. It um, is, as we all know, a beautiful flowering crop and its pollen and nectar attracts bees. Beet is harvested before flowering, so the crop itself does not pose a direct threat. Protecting bees and other pollinators is, of course, a priority for the government through the pollinator strategy. And this is a way we can bring people together, together with researchers, to work to improve the status of pollinating insects. The need to take action to protect sugar beet is not restricted to this country. Twelve beet-producing EU countries have granted emergency authorizations for neonics since 2018. Their authorization conditions have been less stringent than ours. For example, none has applied a threshold to determine whether the product should be used. There's no doubt that if our crop suffered major damage because, we, because there is aphid predation and we don't allow the use of a neonic in an emergency, we would have to import beet from countries where these products are used. We've now had three years to grow the crops without neonics. In 2019, perhaps because of residual levels in the soil, and in 2021, after a cold winter, the virus threat was low. However, 2020 saw severe damage, with about a quarter of the national crop being lost, as we've heard. Some individual growers were even more severely affected. Imports were needed to enable British sugar to honour its contracts, and um, partly because of this, a smaller crop was planted in 2021, with some growers understandably reluctant to take the risk. So taking into account both the scientific evidence and the economic analysis, the decision was taken to grant exceptional temporary use of Cruiser this year. In order to mitigate the risk, conditions of the authorisation include a reduced application rate as well as a prohibition on any flowering crop being planted in the same field within 32 months of a treated sugar beet crop. Our chief scientific advisor advised us on this mitigation in particular. There will be an initial threshold for use, meaning that the seed treatment will only be used if the predicted level of virus is above 19% of the national crop. If this threshold is not met, then, the, seed, then the, the treatment for the seed will not be used. And this is exactly what happened in 2021. So it will only be used in an emergency. And I would like to provide some reassurance, I hope, to members. The maximum amount of neonics which could be used on English crops, if the threshold is reached, will amount to 6% of what used to be used prior to 2018. In reaching our decision, we were informed by the advice of the HSE and the views of the UK Expert Committee on Pesticides and, of course, DEFRA's Chief Scientific Advisor, who has been involved at every stage of the process. We also considered economic issues and were informed by analysis provided by DEFRA economists. The scientific advice identified risks to pollinators and the restrictions we've applied for are designed specifically by our chief scientific advisor to mitigate those risks. Some residual risk remains, but we judge that this is sufficiently low to be outweighed by the benefits to sugar beet production of using the product. In taking this decision, we've wanted to be as transparent as possible and give honourable members as well as members of the public access to the information that informed the decision-making process. And as such, um, I would be delighted to give way. She says that they judged, you judged the bees sufficiently low. Could she say a little bit more about how that judgment was arrived at? 
If I've got time, I would be delighted to, um, though I would actually refer the Honourable Gentleman to the very full set of reasons which is given by, by the Secretary of State on the gov.uk website as well, because that gives the complete decision. Um, what I would say is that DEFRA agrees with HSE that it isn't possible to completely rule out a degree of risk to bees from flowering plants in or near the field in the years after the neonic use. That, that's the concern. But our chief scientific advisors suggest that the risks are reduced to a large extent by that 32-month ban on flowering crops. Um, the materials have been made publicly available, and I was very keen to do that and to make sure that the decision was as transparent as possible. We've published several accompanying documents outlining the key elements involved in making this decision. There is nothing sneaky about this decision. It is all available on gov.uk. And what I would say um, with regard to uh, the suggestion that we have a parliamentary vote on this, I'm happy to look again at how the system works and we will be outlining our ideas about the system, the new system in the National Action Plan which will be published this summer. I would politely say though that there are 10 to 15 applications at least for emergency authorizations every year for different products. And I don't know that the whips, I, I see the Honourable Lady sitting next, um, sitting over there. Um, I don't know that the whips would be thrilled if we had to vote on each of those, nor um, perhaps would that be a, a, a good use of um, parliamentary time. But it, 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 there is no doubt that this is an issue in which parliamentarians take interest. That is right. And I'm always happy to discuss these decisions with anybody that wants to. And please do come and talk to me about the specifics of the decision or the science at any point. Looking to the future, um, it is of course important that industry works hard on the development of alternative sustainable approaches to protect sugar beet from the viruses. These include the development of new tolerant seed varieties measures to improve crop hygiene and husbandry, and modern breeding techniques such as gene editing. Um, there was a parliamentary event at which British Sugar attended and NFU Sugar also attended earlier this week. I, did it, I, I went to and was able to talk to them about how they can interact better with us, telling us about the new products and the new... Um, ideas they can put in place to deal with this problem in the future. Ultimately, of course, our food security relies on a healthy environment and thriving pollinators. Sustainable agriculture and supporting nature go hand in hand. And in our agricultural transition, we are already incentivizing farmers to do the right thing. This year, we're piloting a standard that will help farmers transition away from the use of pesticides and incentivize alternative ways to control pests. This decision, um, Sir Roger, was not taken lightly and is based on a robust scientific assessment. We will continue to work hard to support farmers and to protect and restore our vital pollinator populations. Luke Pollard to wind up the debate. Thank you, Sir Roger, and I'd like to say thank you to all the speakers in the debate today. It is very clear that there's a real passion on a cross-party basis to see a uh, restoration of bee populations, but there's also a passion on a cross-party basis to support our farmers. And uh, as the uh, Shadow Minister has said, they need to be the same objective together rather than in competition with each other. Otherwise, the farmers and nature and us all lose out in that situation. I'm grateful for the Minister for her response. Um, I don't think she adequately explained why she chose to override the scientific advice in this decision. I also note that she didn't concentrate on the 2023 date when neonics would not be used again. So I'm anticipating that this needs to be the last debate that we need to have in this House where neonics will be used. Because if we are here this time next year, then that needs to be subject to a parliamentary vote on just neonicotinoid use rather than the emer other emergency ones because it's clear that the government has set out this, this transition where we will not need to use bee-killing pesticides if bee-killing pesticides are still to be used 
then we are really in danger of not meeting our obligations under the 25-year Environment Plan, the Environment Act, or the Declaration of a Climate and Nature Emergency that Parliament passed in 2019 as well. I'm grateful that the Minister said nothing sneaky was involved with the decision, but nothing science-led seems to be involved in that main decision <laughs> yeah. either. And I think yeah. that is the yeah. problem that we have here. I look forward to the action plan coming out and also, hopefully, the early revision of the National Pollinator Strategy and I think a, a comprehensive consultation starting this year would be a useful place to signal the intention to restore bee populations. I'm grateful, Sir Roger, uh, for you uh, being in the chair and for all the contributions, in particular for those people who contacted us and they weren't able to speak in this debate. And I hope that the, the strength of feeling on a cross-party basis is clear to the Minister and the Secretary of State that bee-killing pesticides should never be used again. Thank you. May I thank all honourable members for managing the time in a manner which has enabled all those who wish to do, to, to do so to participate. The question is that this House has considered government approval for the use of neonicotinoids on, and the impact upon bees. As many of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no, the ayes have it.